with this it gives me immense happiness and and giving me the opportunity to introduce our esteemed speaker dr amita parasuram ma'am ma'am is a retired as associate professor of psychology from jesus and mary college uh, Uni university of delhi in december 2020 having taught psychology for 40 years as a psychologist most of her work focused on making psychology applicable such that it could enhance the quality of life for those very people with psychology claims to study beyond teaching her endeavors have been focused on conducting training workshops ma'am has carried out workshops for 25 years at the corporate and school levels ma'am has been a resource person in national international conferences and numerous panel discussions <clears throat> special programs were at the invite of ge ge women asia network summit malaysia and ge asia talent forum japan where delegates from 10 different countries participated in the workshops conducted by her most of her work revolves around gender related issues effective interpersonal relationships mental health and human belief system ma'am follows and practices the cognitive behavioral paradigm of psychology the second passion is to write urdu poetry which reflects a spread of all the concern mentioned above albeit in the different language and style in 2019 she started speaking on public platform against uh, khatin ka mushaira i'm really sorry ma'am if i pronouncing it in any wrong way that's women's mushaira favoring combined mushaira with men and women sharing the same platform on the grounds of good poetry only her shayari is published in a book entitled ishq lamhe by vani prakashan group she is currently working on a book that complies influential contribution by women poets in the last 150 years so i think it was really an amazing uh, way to and honor to introduce my speaker ma'am now the stage is all yours thank you thank you so much uh, pritika i am very happy to be here and to start with i'd like to thank shubhra ma'am and sifs for this opportunity for me to interact i have attended a couple of sessions and i can see that the people attending the students the youngsters are very enthusiastic and very involved and that's really very good because that encourages the speaker also to come out with more and more so uh let me start with a uh, well since we have talked about an urdu couplet uh urdu poetry i'll start with an urdu couplet for the topic that i'm going to cover and i request kritika that uh, if you could uh, open my slide and people can some people like visual pointers also so that slides are uh, for them yes um, yes we'll keep it uh, the couplet i start with uh, for some people who are not hindi speaking i'll translate it it says meri baaton ko kyun gila samjhe kya kaha maine aap kya samjhe simply speaking it's uh, the the poet is saying that uh, what have you made what meaning have you made of what i said i wanted to say something else and you understood entirely differently meri baaton ko kyun gila gila is shikwa complain why did you think i'm complaining that's not what i was doing i think when we are talking about communication these kind of misunderstandings are abundant very often we end up being in a very tight spot with both sides saying look i didn't say that and you understood wrongly and the person says no but you did say that this kind of tug of war happens in every relationship my focus today is on a classroom and uh, therefore while i will be talking about classroom uh, for the illustration my claim is that the points which i'm going to bring are applicable in almost every relationship and the extension of the classroom would be into any relationship which is between someone with authority figure like in a parent child relationship so most of the basics of communication apply everywhere okay so let's start with the first slide where we are looking at a very simple thing ki what is communication anyways when we communicate there is uh, this shubhra ma'am has already done so i will just take a couple of minutes to move connect it with my uh, uh, class today that there are two people at least minimum and one person is a sender the other person is a receiver and the sender says something 
and receiver has to receive it and then respond to it is the basic communication loop. What do we do when we communicate? Using any kind of language or any other medium, channels can be many. It can be language and verbal message. It can be a body language and a silent message or facial expression based message, or it can be a mail written and sent. Um, uh, whatever be the medium we use, Communication means you're sharing your ideas, you're sharing your thoughts, opinions, or your feelings, or your uh, beliefs with someone, okay? That's what it is. Communication is something in you reaches the other person, okay? So this is the basic of communication. Aim, why it is done, and second, what is the loop? Now, when it's the loop between the sender and the receiver, there can be difficulties there, which we'll talk about. But my focus and reference point will be classroom in which the, this communication, the give and take is happening between a teacher and a student or a group of students. Next slide, please. So when we talk about this process, my question here is, surely there's communication, X says something to Y, Y may respond, may not respond, may understand, not understand. But a process has happened, but this process is not all the time effective, not all the time the ultimate optimal. Why does this failure happen? I personally think as a psychologist that there is a, the biggest problem in human relationships is that of communication. And uh, particularly, I can speak more about my country, in our country, uh, the, the dynamics in a family, uh, the agenda in school, we, we are taught how to read, we are taught how to write, yeah, we are taught how to speak, uh, how, to, uh, how to speak, but one of the things which is really missing is that the focus is more on academic, not on relationships, and uh, also one thing which is missed out is we are never taught how to listen. So, this communication gap that we talk about, it comes because both at the sending level, the sending end and the receiving end, they can be noises. We call them noises or barriers. Next slide, please. Now, what really are these noises? So today I'm going to try and make this process very, very simple so that you can really take it to your relationships and be able to apply little things that I bring here in these 45 minutes or so. I really love this quote that I've just shared with you. There's a difference between knowing. I assume when teachers get a job, of course, unless they make a back row, back row entry, good teachers coming through merit, they have knowledge. That's why they've become teachers in a school, college, or wherever. But there's a difference between knowing, which we assume a selected teacher has about the subject for which she or he has been selected, and teaching. And the difference comes from how communication happens in a classroom. Okay, I really love this quote because it highlights that just taking certificates and becoming a teacher on the basis of those certificates, which are based on what you wrote in your exams, etc., is not enough to be an effective communicator in that relationship where you have to teach. And teaching for me, I've been a teacher for 40 years. I have never looked at teaching as teaching the syllabus. For me, it was syllabus as the medium for me to bring life to my students. It's teaching life, okay? So role of communication becomes even bigger if you want to expand your role to go beyond the syllabus teaching. Next slide, please. Now, effective communication, I personally believe starts always. And for a teacher, this is of course a big challenge to be a good listener. As I've said, you're a receiver and you're a sender. So the teacher as a receiver, then on the other hand, we have students as the receiver. Are they good listeners? Do we have many good listeners around us? Who is a good listener? I feel that very often people just hear a lot of things. That means their ears are receiving certain input, some electrical impulses, but are they really listening? And even after they listen, are they really good listeners? The denominator that I want to bring to you of who is a good listener, I think a good listener is someone who is not just picking up the words, focusing on the words that are being said by the other, but tries to read between the lines, tries to get to the emotions that are conveyed, which may not be part of the words or the sentences, 
who tries to understand the meaning that the speaker is trying to give. I am very sure all of you have had these communication issues where you say, okay, so this is what you're saying. And the other say, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. And I'm sure you have been on this side also. And you've said, listen, you can't understand. I've told you many times, but I don't think you can understand. So where is this coming from, this gap? Why? Because I personally think that it's all a question of having the right intention to want to listen to someone. Very often people hear out, but don't listen. Meaningfully understanding what the other person is saying and empathetically, I'm going to highlight these two aspects of, of listening because unless you listen to the person to get their perspective, what they are trying to say, and this lack of perspective is what was there in my Urdu couplet, Kya kaha maine, aap kya samjhe. I said something, but you, you understood something different. Next slide. So now we have to obviously understand what good listening demands. How can it become meaningful? How can we get the meaning that the other person is trying to convey to us? May I have the next slide, please? I think if you get any thoughts in your mind where you have had a good or a bad listening experience, either as a speaker or as a listener, Please make a note so that you can cross check with me towards the end. Now, I have noticed that when I look at people in how they listen to others, there can be a very wide range of these five points I share with you. There are people who are just not interested in listening. They may actually ignore you or dismiss you. Very often, if you want to start talking about maybe some difficulty with your friend over a phone and immediately he or she says, look, um, I have something important to do right now. They are very blunt about it and blatant. And uh, even when you are talking, for example, uh, from a teacher's point of view, very often um, the teacher speaks, but uh, the students are not listening. She can see, and I think I could see by the facial expressions when I was teaching, they were interested students and there were those who were not. So those who didn't want to listen were sitting there an unfortunate reality of DU is that they have a tendency so some people sit there because they want, but there were those who were so engrossed. There were those I could make out from their body language, their facial expressions, the look in their eyes. So there are some who ignore, that means non-listeners. There are some who pretend with some body language, minimal encourages, um, you know, they may keep nodding their head and all, but if you, if you surprise them with a question, then they don't know what to say because they were not really listening, they were just pretending. Then there are slightly better category of selective listeners. They may listen to you if, you know, even if they are not listening some important words, this is what psychological researches show, that in selective listening, some important words which are of meaning to you uh, uh, fall in your ears, then you suddenly become alert and you see, yeah, 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 okay, so that part you listen to because it interests you. But where you stop being important in that conversation, you may fade away from that. And that's the selective listener for you. And then there is an attentive listener, someone who is truly listening to every word said, trying to understand what, what, what really is being said, make meaning out of it as accurately as possible. But still something may be missing. And that something comes in the first category. You know, you've, you must have sometimes shared your difficult moments or some bad experience with some people. When you share with someone, your friend is a very sincere friend, he or she understands. And you know that this person is listening to you, but at the end you feel a little vacuum. And, and you know where that vacuum comes from? That comes from their inability to connect with you empathetically. What is empathy? It's an emotional connect where they not only understand the words, but also the, the, the embedded emotions and feelings in it. And they actually try to experience what you must be feeling. Let me see what you are feeling right now. That's, that's true empathetic listening. Next slide, please. According to Stephen Covey, who is one of my very favorite writers, whose very popular book I read about 20 years ago, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think he talks about this concept of empathetic listening very beautifully, whereby um, you know, it meets the requirement of human beings Stephen Covey's very important quote I've given here, which says, next to physical survival, the greatest need of human beings is psychological survival. I have a feeling there's a huge need for psychological survival, even more so after the pandemic. Now, what is that? 
And in a classroom setting for a particular teacher to be aware of this psychological need is very important for communication to be good, to be understood, to be affirmed, to be validated, to be appreciated. Now, I feel that if a teacher can become an empathetic listener, a listener who listens to the students saying what they are saying, but between the lines also, there are emotions spread all over. There are hesitations, there are uh, shortcomings which the child is not willing to talk about, but something reaches you. If you can be empathetic, you can read those nuances, then you are a teacher whose students are going to feel very good because they feel heard, they feel validated for being who they are. Very often the student com students complain that so-and-so teacher but just doesn't listen. She comes, she reads, uh, she, she teaches, or she discusses the PowerPoints very nicely. I love those lessons, but, and then that but is coming from not feeling heard. Many people, many teachers are not interested in that aspect, but I would say it is an essential aspect. Next slide, please. Now, we have difficulty with listening very often. And I would say, when I'm saying become an empathetic listener, it applies to both sides. Uh, by and large, I will be referring to the teacher in the process, but please those who are students must also recognize that any communication is an effective communication if it is a two-way thing. So everything that applies to the teacher applies to the student also, but certain differences are there because the teacher is more of a power figure, authority figure, and I will definitely refer to some points towards the end. Till then, this process in the classroom is applied to both sides because they are interacting. If the student is a bad listener or the teacher is a bad listener, what could be the reasons? Or in our general conversations outside the classroom also. The first and foremost, as I've said, is you don't really want to listen. You're disinterested. Second, maybe that you're interested partly, maybe a bit selectively you are there, but you are very impatient. You don't have the patience to listen to people. Uh, you're more, you know, there's an exercise I often do in, a, in, a, in my workshops. So there are people, and you can do it on your own. I'm giving you the exercise openly because then if you do it with your friends, you will recognize what I'm saying. So there are four people, five people. So you can sit in a circle. And now of course you can do online for five people being there. There are rules of, you can speak only in a certain order. I used to use clockwise or anti-clockwise. And there is a theme given to the first speaker. The first speaker speaks for a few seconds. Then the second one has to speak something relevant to what the first said. Then the third person has to speak something relevant to what the second said. And we do about five or 10 such rounds. Afterwards, when I ask people, how did they feel? What was the good and bad of this? Definitely both plus minus come. But that impatience, you know, very sad thing about listening is that most of the people, when they're listening, they're listening with the intent to reply. Or and that, that causes their internal distraction because they are listening to one word, an interesting thought comes to your mind, and then you start thinking about what I want to say. In the process, you miss out a big section of what the speaker is saying. So impatience and disinterest are the first set of reasons where you cannot become a good listener. The second thing I've seen in classrooms very often, and of course everywhere, but a lot more prominently in classrooms is biases and prejudices that you hold in your head. You know, if you like your student or not like your student X, Y, Z, can decide how you interpret. Because in communication, what is said may reach the other person the right way if it's an effective process and may not. How what you said is interpreted and made meaning of will depend on a number of intervening factors. Biases and prejudices is one of those. So when you as a listener are biased, let me give an example. There's a class happening. The teacher, the student, one student raises a hand and says, ma'am, I really can't understand this particular uh, theory uh, section that you are teaching today. Now, you see, if it's a, a good teacher, she is likely to be objective. She is likely to be aware of it that she must understand why this student is not able to understand. And therefore, she will have to ask questions which will allow the student to share her difficulty. But if she is a biased and a prejudice against this particular girl, for example, then 
she will perhaps end up reacting by saying, so what do you think, uh, I'm not uh, teaching well? Now she has taken the sentence, I can't understand the lesson of today, today's class as an attack on herself. This may come from disliking, having a bias against one student or students in general. But sometimes these, these kind of reactions can come from their biographical uh, existence also. For example, when you are listening through the lens of your biography, from your personal life history. So it's possible that this teacher has been criticized so much in her life as a child that any criticism she, she starts reacting to. So she listens to the statement, I can't understand this lesson to mean that the teacher, she's personalizing it now and she will think that I am being told that I'm not good enough. You understand, but it's all happening subconsciously, unconsciously. I don't think if we ever confront this teacher to say that this something must have happened with you or you don't like this girl that she'll admit because she may not even be aware of it, but we can become aware if we want to enhance our listening skill. Next is physical and mental states. You can be a bad listener because you're feeling very tired, you have fever, you are very exhausted, stressed out, and obviously your cognitive faculties do not function fully. Or you may be in an emotional mental state. Uh, for example, if you're angry, in a very, very strong angry state, you can't be a good listener. That's why we often say, when you're in an angry mood, that's really not the right time to sort out things with anybody. You cannot be a good communicator. You cannot be a good listener. If you are feeling very depressed and low, that's also not going to make you be alert to what others are trying to say. So it is important to look at these as the barriers. I've already talked about autobiography-based filter, you know, listening with everything brought to your life, personalizing everything to your life, that's wrong. And last is internal, external distractors. I'll give an example of internal distractor. One more will do that if you are, have something very heavily on your mind, some problem you're facing, some crisis situation, that's an internal distractor. You try very hard, but you can't listen. In those moments, it's really the right thing to say is, look, I'm right now not with you. I can't fully grasp rather than pretending. So that's one. One of the external distractors I find very irritating and overwhelmingly present around us is the cell phone in anybody's hand. They're listening to you. There's a notification. And suddenly, you know, in the middle of a very sensitive sharing that's happening or a meaningful sharing, the person looks at the cell phone and then you know the speaker feels kind of left out and uh, the person is distracted obviously can't get fully the message so these are some they're not exhausting the list but these are some prominent distractors uh, sorry uh, barriers and noise at the listening end next slide please now when we are talking about good process of listening a teacher in a classroom has to understand where the students come from how will she answer their questions how will she understand their limitations? Likewise, I say, it's a two-way process. No one-way communication is good. So the students also, in their role, I'm not saying they have to understand the teacher as a person. That's not their duty. And while a teacher can step beyond the teacher role and try and become a mentor, try and become a kind of a help, helping person, counselor kind of helping person, students are not supposed to do that. So there are differences. But... Having said that, to understand the teacher's perspective is something which is not often talked about or written about in the books. I feel that in a classroom, a healthy relationship demands that both sides understand the process and take different responsibilities of their own to make themselves more effective. So what is the requirement here? Being open to messages given by the students, messages open, uh, uh, open to messages by the teacher on the part of the student, uh, not to be judgmental about it, not to have defenses about it. If you don't understand what the student is saying as a teacher, you know, sometimes I notice that teachers are very reluctant to say, oh, I haven't understood. Suppose it's a subject-related question, the subject a student asks, and they don't understand that. Very often they dismiss it. Very often te teachers become defensive about it. Oh, you ask too many questions. I've seen that happening in schools. I used to do a lot of training with schools. And I noticed that some teachers are very uh, close to taking too many questions from a very brilliant child because that kind of, you know, uh, disturbs their, their uh, very organized way of just finishing the course. 
So we have to be non-judgmental, unbiased, open to listening to things. And if it is not clear, we can ask. Now, there's a very important skill you have to use here, which is called paraphrasing. Paraphrasing is when you heard something, to make sure that you heard the right thing, you say it in your words back to the person and say after that a question, have I, have I understood you correctly? It's a very important skill for a teacher. You have... You've heard, you listened, but to make sure that, because you see, there are times when any message communicated can have multiple meanings. So we have to make sure that we are arriving at the meaning of what the message is saying, which the student is going to try to communicate to us, okay? So we must check the correctness of what we have listened to. After we have heard and listened and understood, we arrive at some meaning making, some interpretation of it. This is what this girl is trying to say or this boy is trying to say. And once we have clarified that we are on the right track, then only we evaluate it from the point of view of what should I say? You will not believe it that between any message given and a response to it, probably there is a one second uh, gap between the two, not more than that. Whereas to understand the meaning of whatever anybody is saying, one should be processing for about four or five seconds at least in their head, in trying to understand what is their perspective or what is their doubt about the class lesson or what is the feeling they are conveying. Because uh, this whole thing between giving a question to the student and expecting an answer also is an average of one second only. Teachers are so impatient sometimes. So that should not happen. And this is the process which can become effective if you just take a resolve to do it. It's really not something which is you know, rocket science. It's a question of making the intention to do it. Can I have the next slide, please? It's about, it's about wanting to do it. Now, we have talked about becoming a good listener so far to, to get the message as the person wants to convey it to you, whether the message is an emotion, whether the message is a complaint, whether its message is a, a subject related a message, whichever it might be. Particularly for the teacher, it's more important because this effective communication process in the classroom has to start with the teacher. I give this responsibility to the teacher in a parent-child relationship, I give this responsibility to the parent. Once they initiate, Definitely the student or the child has to be engaged and slowly this can become a very, very beautiful mutual process. Now we are moving to becoming a sender. Communication, ka, that aspect where you have to speak, you have to say. Now you see this communication, misunderstandings, gaps, they, these noises, the barriers in that can be at the speaking level, at the sending message level also. So far we have talked about being poor listener, now we can talk about being a poor sender and how you can become an effective and a good sender. I'm going to talk about a few criteria uh, in the limited time, which seem to me the topmost. Of course, there's a longer list. The first point I've taken is clarity and focus. I'm assuming here that a teacher is a teacher because she knows her subject and that's why she's been employed. So I, I won't write here, but important criterion is knowledge. Sometimes teacher can't communicate on a subject because they may not have enough knowledge, they may not read, they may not do research reading, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm assuming that I'm be talking about a good, good knowledgeable teacher. But after that, some good knowledgeable teacher may not be able to communicate in the class. That's why the saying which I gave earlier, there's a difference between knowing and, and teaching. Teach, if you teach well, that's only because you can communicate that knowledge in your head to the person. So what is clarity? You know, I must share with you a very interesting example, which comes to my mind every time I talk about clear communication. So clear to be clear is not so easy. It depends on the choice of words in a big way. It depends on how clearly you have, the, you have conveyed and articulated what you want. Uh, in one workshop, it was a very interesting experience and it won't take more than a minute. So there was this participant who said, you know, Amita, I want to share an experience which tells me that we were having unclear communication between me and my wife. So I said, okay, please do share. 
So he said, one day my wife called up and I was in the office. So we talked for a while. Then at 8, 8.30, I reached home. The moment I reached home, my wife said, oh, so where are my Roshagullas? Roshagulla is an Indian sweet. Uh, and this is how it is pronounced in Calcutta. So uh, he said, what Roshagulla? She said, oh, uh, you were supposed to bring me Roshagullas on your way back from the office. He said, no, you never said that. So his wife said, oh, but I did tell you that I feel like having some sweet. And he said, but okay. Uh, but you didn't say bring the Rashagula. She said, I thought you will understand when I feel like having some sweet, you know which is my favorite Rashagula and you will pick it up on the way, the way you used to when we got married 10 years ago. And so they ended up having a lot of uh, uh, argument and negative emotions in that moment where she said, you don't understand me anymore, etc. You see, in that case, when he became, he also became sarcastic and he said, uh, I have a better way of, uh, I think there's a better way of handling it. Next time you want to have Rashagulla, call up and tell me, pick up Rashagulla from that shop for me. I think while it's a very funny one, I'm sure they, all, they went through a very, very difficult evening that, that evening. What happened here? Why was her message not clear? She said, I feel like having a sweet today. It's a very abstract kind of a sharing. There's a difference between concrete and abstract communication. Concrete is which is very clear, specific, focused. And abstract is where there can be many different meanings, multiple meanings you can attach or interpret from that sentence. I feel like having some sweet. So this man, in that argument and fight, if you can call it verbal fight, he said, she said, I told I feel like having some sweet. He said, I thought that if you feel like having some sweet, you will have it. So abstract communication, that is unclear communication or ambiguous communication leads to misunderstanding because it leaves a scope for people to make as many meanings out of it as possible. It's very important that when a teacher is addressing the students, whether it is with respect to a personal message or it is with respect to a lesson related message the language is very specific and very clear if a theory is being talked about it will reach the student only if it is given in very clear terms and the components of the theory are given in very clear terms okay next slide please so that clarity being clear now how do we become clear i'm also going to give you some very important indicators for that just saying become clear is not enough I strongly believe that if I'm asking you to be clear, then I should also be able to tell you what are the things you got to work on. Knowledge I've talked about. Second is language command. I think it's very sad that today we are living times where cell phones and uh, computers, when they correct your language and all, are discouraging people from mastering the language themselves. And I have found many teachers who are so reluctant or so inhibited and so not capable of expressing five sentences regarding a particular thought. I have done some observations of the classrooms on that basis I'm talking about this when I did some schoolwork. So language command, whichever language it may be, is very important. As a teacher, you have no right to be a teacher if you have not mastered a language because all the knowledge that you have here, if you do not have the skill to communicate it to the students, then I don't see you should be taking up that role. Third, from that language which you've mastered, choice of the right words and the right phrases for that moment, depending on the kind of message it is. Next, your ability to break very complex messages. Sometimes the teacher has to do this. There's a very complex message. It's not reaching the students and the students are like, ma'am, we don't understand. It is important for a teacher to know that clarity will come if she can break that complex into small units, explain each unit and then put it together. I'll give you an example. So when I used to start my chapters, I used to give at least about 20 minutes or 25 minutes to just discussing the topic of the new chapter. So for example, when I was teaching personality disorders, now we took some time to recall what they had learned about definition of personality, what it is, unless they know what is personality independently and they know what is disorders independently. And then I put these two together, chances are it will remain a very vague kind of abstraction in their head. So breaking complex into small units and putting them together makes their message clear, okay? Sometimes to make a message clear, next point is 
we can take support from many things like videos or we can take uh, support from case studies or we can take games, ex experiential exercise in a classroom. I'll give you just one example that suppose I want to do an exercise, I want to clarify the point of uh, what is to observe. I was doing a practical with my students on observation. You believe it or not, I spent two periods, which means 100, 100 minutes on helping them understand what observation is. Let me share what I did very briefly. So they did not know I'm doing a role, a role play, but I had planned with someone to enter my room to ask me about something. So when she knocked, she was not from this class. Uh, I called her in, we talked about X, Y, Z, and then she went off after two minutes. After that, I asked the class, please report your observations about what transpired at my end. Believe me, there were so many observations which were not observations. Like for example, one girl said, ma'am, she seemed very agitated. She seemed very nervous. Now you see, being nervous is an interpretation. It is not observation. So I said, how did you come to this conclusion that she's nervous? Oh, because she was standing, she was moving very fidgety when she was standing there. So I said, what is observation? Observation is fidgety body movement. And agitation is interpretation based on these observations. So I'm talking about how I did this role play. So you can make your message clear because observations and dhana to explain this, to describe this, demands that it be experienced by the child. And then only they will understand it. So sometimes I use uh, films. Uh, there's a film I used, a time, uh, uh, time, a time to Kill, which was for empathy, my most favorite film, which I used to always show. Uh, and empathy used to become absolutely clear to them. So any support that you can get, uh, you should take for clarity. Completeness. Clarity and completeness are correlated. Completeness means your message is clear if you have given assumptions, if you have shared the reason for it, aim for it, and the goal for it. For example, if I tell the class, uh, from now on, you all have to bring a textbook in my class. Bus, that's all I say. Now, they're going to wonder, what is the sudden change in the rules of this classroom? But if I say, from now on, I want you to bring your class a textbook because I noticed that this will help you in connecting with your message. And I will tell you which are the things to be marked. It will save your time to go back and mark on your own. And these are the highlights which I want you to mark, which we will talk about more. They will know why I am asking them to carry a thick book. And my students used to bring the books whenever I asked them because they knew the, the reasoning behind. Then there is appropriateness. I feel that very often classroom teaching can go way above the levels or understandings of the students. That should not happen. A teacher must make a message which is uh, appropriate to the frame of reference and level of understanding of the students. Next slide, please. Um, time is, okay. Now, uh, another very important feature of communication is related to whether the students participate in the class or not. I think any class where two students don't participate is a failed class, it's a failure. So how can communication help here in participation? I think one very important thing is that after teaching a lesson, if the teacher says a question that uh, uh, right now we take a pause and I'd like to know what you think about X, Y, Z, whatever thought she has uh, shared or, or, or a theory or a concept she shared. And where do you think it applies? So these kind of questions with short breaks after giving one full component that you have taught uh, is a very nice breather. It is a time when students can reflect over it. And then when they are made to answer, that becomes their participation. For example, sometimes in psychology, I had the opportunity obviously to ask uh, does it relate with your life? Is there any such experience you can talk about? And that used to encourage participation. I have always said to my classes, whenever I meet a new group, that may, I'm going to be open to even if 20 questions are asked, because just finishing the course is not my aim. And that kind of a very personal share, of course, you have to have a very good relationship with them. If you are an empathetic listener, that relationship will come. Only a good relationship can allow the space for the student to feel secure that I can ask this question from this teacher, okay? The second thing which can make participation by the student very good 
is if you're open to uh, giving feedback, when the student has done something good and you celebrate that and you say, you know, that's the most fantastic example I've ever heard. Give them feedback on the spot. Many teachers don't do that. Uh, that can really encourage participation. Secondly, participation will be good if, even if as a teacher, you're open to taking feedback. If the student says, but ma'am, I have a disagreement with you. I think that openness, and if you as a teacher, you are reactive and defensive, you will say, uh, so, uh, what is the thing, what is the difference? That's not the way it has to be. You have to be open to feedback. And if you say, please share with me the difference of opinion that you have, and uh, you listen to it and you don't react or become angry because sometimes the difference of opinion may show that the teacher's view was wrong. We're all human. We can all have uh, that much knowledge, but nobody is, nobody is really full knowledgeable, you know? So these two factors really encourage participation. And I think, this participation depends on effective communication. That's why I include it in the context of effective communication in classroom. Next slide, please. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that a good effective communication has to be connected with a teacher being interactive in her class. Any communication which is one way, I know of teachers who have entered the room, opened their PowerPoints, spoken for 55 minutes and gone out. Not a question asked, not a question made. So interactive approach and teacher's openness to questions, which is part of effective communication, to comments, to detours from the ongoing topic. Sometimes, you know, we take a little off because the student is wanting to illustrate something. Then the example may be wrong, but you see, that's also for me an opportunity. If the student is giving an example which is wrong, that's also an opportunity to teach, to tell why this example is not right. Rather than dismissing, oh, wait, don't give wrong examples and waste my time. No, I think detour that is going off the topic for a while. If the student is making an effort to speak, we have to be patient, we have to listen to it. We have to listen to also the wrong thing and a good teacher will convey what was the basis of it being wrong? And that also is a learning for the student. So I think that's the thing which very often I don't find in the classrooms. And these kind of, and then of course, using humor, wit, uh, a little musty. I think these are very important aspects of making your lessons lighter, enjoyable, motivating, encouraging, and also sometimes, while it's not the role of the teacher, but I think your communication can add an entertainment aspect to it. So very often, uh, you know, for example, I'll tell you one, one example of it. So my students sometimes used to say, ma'am, psychologists are supposed to be with the best of mental health, but I met so-and-so psychologist and my God, I was shocked because this one seems to need therapy. So my response to that was that, and it was information as well as said in a light mood, but uh, correct information. I said, listen, psychology attracts two kinds of people, those who want to help, but also those who need help. So they can be a mix of people. Sometimes they have come to it not for what they can do for others, but for trying to do better for themselves, but they are not aware of it. So they end up messing up many things. So this was a kind of a detour in a class, but I think it turned out to be an important kind of a learning and the student felt happy. So if you are open, interactive, the students will definitely be more happy, more motivated and encouraged to participate, encouraged to be... I had a student taking uh, 20 minutes of my class once because we were talking emotions, emotional intelligence and so on. And at that moment, she was in such a mental uh, sad state because she had lost her dog. Her dog had died. Now you will say, what is the significance of the dog in the classroom? But you see, I saw her normally very active student. I saw her body language, her face. And I was like, uh, something's not okay, are you all right? Now, I think teacher's communication has to go beyond words. Now I'm coming to body language. So I understood her body language. I said that. And she started crying. And, and then at the end of the class, when later she came, she said, ma'am, is it okay we are talking about emotions that I've written a small piece about my dog? Can I talk about it? Can I read that out to my class? You tell me whether I did right by making space for that somewhere. And it was an important lesson for everyone to empathetically connect with their loss. So I think this is where I come from, where I have no problem in making spaces for things which are not directly related to, but indirectly definitely contributing to 
teaching, uh, learning by the students of what I'm trying to teach. Next slide, please. So uh, effective communication demands that the teacher understands, I've just said, the body language. Body language, Kai, I'll just tell you very quickly two things. Body language includes understanding facial expression, expression in the eyes, the way you position your body, the interpersonal distance between the two, and movement, your fidgety movement of the legs or hands or feet, etc. That's body language. And para languages, the tone related, your voice related variations. So very pitchy when somebody is anxious, it can be loud when they are angry, loudness, pitch, the speed with which you speak, we call it speech pattern. And then the last point, very important, which word in a sentence is stressed? Because depending on which word in the sentence is stressed, the meaning can change totally. For example, if I say, I want to go. Now I'm stressing I. Versus if I say, I want to go. Now these two sentences will have a very different meaning. First one says, you don't have to go. I want to go. You know, nobody's telling me to go. I want to go. The second one, I want to go. That is conveying a very different meaning. Implication is that I cannot take it anymore. So don't try to stop me. I'm going. So remember, in communication, there are spoken words and there are implications. The unsaid, the hidden between the lines, nuances. And those are in a huge way governed by body language and para language. Okay. So becoming aware of this is an extremely important part of not just classroom, but all human relationships depend on that, on how effectively you can understand people, particularly counselors and therapists. If they don't understand it, parents, if they don't understand it, teachers, they cannot really connect with people who are at the receiving end of their authority or their expert expertise. Next slide, please. I'm ending with this last slide and then open to all the questions. It is necessary that the process of communication is understood mutually by the teacher and the student to make teaching learning process effective. I think the most important thing is learning all these sub skills which I have talked about, but making sure that you have created in the very first meeting with the students a certain mutuality where the student feels that this is a platform where I can speak as me, myself, where I can ask questions, where I'm not going to be judged. Bottom line, this communication from the teacher can be the reason for that classroom being a very safe space for the student, where this student can be the psychological survivor, this student can be what he or she is rather than what he or she is expected to be by the society or by the classroom or by the college or by the office or by the management, etc. So I think this is these are the important aspects of effective communication. Um, I'm open to any of the questions that you may have and I'll be happy to answer.